God bless us. This is Pastor Stephen J of Faith Works Church right here in Apopka, Florida. We want to welcome you to another Faith Works broadcast. I hope and pray that you guys had a blessed week. Welcome to December. Can't believe it's December already, but before I forget, if you are watching me live, which I am live right now, do me a favor. Hit that like and that share button. If you are watching me on YouTube, Please hit that uh, like and share. Matter of fact, I need you to hit the subscribe button. According to YouTube, YouTube said I can go live on YouTube if I get 50 subscribers. So I need 50 subscribers on YouTube. I know um, I started off using uh, YouTube, I don't know, a couple years ago, and then I just stopped and just went Facebook Live. Uh, but YouTube said I can go live if I get 50 subscribers on YouTube. So if you follow me on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button, then I can go live on YouTube as well. Again, I hope and pray that you guys have had a blessed week. I hope and pray that you and your family are in good health and in good strength. Um, we are going to get right into the Word of God today. And I actually found, I don't know if you guys can see this picture in the background. I found this picture, this was actually a year ago. I took my bike out on a wildlife drive and I didn't know if the sun was going to do anything. You guys can see it was very cloudy, but the sun got down to this point and it just lit the sky up just like so crazy. And I, I was the only one out there on the drive. I was the only one out there and the sky was just like lit up. And I was just like, man, I'm like in so awe when stuff like that happens. It was just like that the other day. And I love it when people get different angles. Diane and Misha got different angles of the sky that I got from behind the airport the other day. And it's awesome when I see that. But you know, every time I see something like that, I think of that one scripture that says, the heavens declare the glory of God. It shows how great God is. And when you see something like that in the sky, it's just not random. It's just not uh, the coming together of neutrons and electrons and protons and all these things. There is a creator behind this creation and it is, is God. And that brings me to the subject of letting God be God. The intro. Letting God be God. What do I mean by just letting God be God? There are a lot of believers out there that believe that it is their job to judge, it's their job to insinuate, it's their job to push, it's their job to pull or whatever. And you guys heard me say this. I grew up in a church where it was very strict. I grew up, you know, you can only do certain things. It was just very strict. And I remember twice, maybe three times, I kind of just like, please, God ain't in that. And the first time was <clears throat> I came to service, Prayer Temple Church, actually. And there were, uh, I saw like women had on, I'm trying to think, they had on pants. And I'm just like, I was immediately thrown off by it because of the way I grew up. And I'm just like, <clears throat> And they were praising God or whatever. And I'm just like, whatever. Um, and just as I'm like pfft, spitting on that, what that move of God that was happening, voice of God was like, they're praising me, not what they got on. Which gets me to understand that, you know, that scripture where Samuel is looking for the next king of Israel and he goes to Jesse's house and he sees Jesse and he brings Jesse's son. Jesse brings all his sons before Samuel and the first person he brings the oldest, which was Eliab. And he looks at Eliab and he was like, man, surely the Lord's anointing is with him. He was looking at the outward appearance, how tall, how strong and the, the Eliab looked like the part. And God said to Samuel, he was like, why are you looking at the outward appearance? I don't look at the outward appearance, but I look at what's on the inside. No, he's not the one. I rejected him. So that says that there was something wrong in Eliab's heart. So Samuel was like, well, is this all your sons? And he was like, Samuel was like, nah. Jesse was like, nah. And he brought one, two, three, four, five, six, and none of them. And then he was like, is that it? And he was like, no, we got the youngest one, but he's out in the field with the sheep. He's like, bring him. 
And when uh, David gets there, the Lord said, that's him, anoint him. And see, the thing is, David didn't have a chance to get dressed and prepare because Samuel the prophet was coming to town. Now, David didn't have a chance to like get cleaned up. He was with the sheep, sheep hanging with the sheep, funky just like the sheep. But when he got there, he came to God as he was and God said, that's him, man after my own heart, in pursuit of my own heart, that's him, anoint him. I forgot what I was going with that. How we can be judgmental the second time. I was at Church on a Rock. And the youth, it was a youth service and the youth service and all the youth got into the middle of the aisle of the church and they were like, just ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. And immediately I was like, that's a rap song. That's a worldly song. And you're trying to turn it into God's word or whatever, blah, blah. But then I saw the spirit of God literally walk through the middle of the aisle at Church on a Rock and these kids, these teenagers, these Young is probably like maybe five and six or whatever, falling out in the spirit and crying because the spirit of God was walking from the front of the church all the way to the back where all of the children, there was no children left standing because the spirit of God slayed them. The third time this happened was Church on the Rock came to visit us. And we at the time had a praise dance group. And I immediately, I was on the organ, and I immediately, I dismissed it because this has nothing to do with God. God is not in this whatsoever. I got up from the organ, and I left. I don't either, I think I went to the bathroom, or maybe I went upstairs because I didn't want to see it. It had nothing to do with it. I wasn't for it, so I went upstairs. And then I came back downstairs, And when I opened up the door, these young kids at the time, grow adults now, were just crying out in the spirit, crying out before God. And God had just moved in the service to the point that the bishop didn't even preach because the spirit of God was doing something and God did it through the praise dance. And it was at that moment, that third time that I said, all right, God, I'll never say what you can't do because you're not in it because you just proved me wrong three times. And this is the last time that I'm ever going to say that you can't, you won't, you are not in. And that was the last time that I've ever said God can't be in that. I said all that to say, letting God be God is, what do we say? Well, let me get, let me, let me, let, matter of fact, let me just get into the word because I'm about to talk about what is already I'm about to talk about on my slides, but letting God be God. Hebrews chapter 11 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. There's something about faith that pleases God. Man, uh, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think. It was Abraham, not Abraham, it was Noah who offered up a sacrifice and the Bible says that God was pleased. Smell the sweet. It wasn't from the sacrifice. Smell the sweet savor. It wasn't from the sacrifice. It was because of Noah's obedience that God was pleased with. Because God had told Noah, God, I need you to do something that does not make sense. I need you to build an ark. Why build an ark, God? Because it's going to rain. Why is it going to What is rain, God? Because at the time, Noah had never, no one had never seen rain. The Bible says that a mist went up from the earth at the time and it watered the earth. That tells you about global warming, that you didn't need rain, that a mist rose up from the earth. 
that's almost like a, uh, oh my God, it's not an aquarium, but it's a, uh, what is it, guys? Help me out. It's not an aquarium, but it's, who? No, 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 it's not an aquarium. It's just, it's an aquarium like, but they don't, it's just, they're just keeping plants inside. Terrarium, thank you. The earth was like a terrarium where the conditions were so right that you didn't have to water anything because the earth watered itself. That was going on in Genesis from one and one until the flood. So when God told Noah to build an ark because it was going to rain, Noah had never seen rain before because the earth was like a terrarium and it watered itself. The mist rose out and it watered the plants and the animals drunk from everything. But when Noah did that, he offered up a sacrifice after he was due because God smelled the sweet savor because he was pleased by the obedience. But Hebrews right here, 11 and 6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. God is pleased when we believe. God is pleased when we obey. God is pleased when we act. God is pleased when we allow him to be God. Letting God be God. Letting God be God. So if I believe, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. What am I believing? That he is God. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. I know there's a lot of pastors out there and a lot of preachers out there, a lot of Christians out there that associate God with financial gain, associate God with success. There used to be a show called The Life of the Rich and Famous. And uh, I forgot the guy's name, but he would go out and interview the people and he would show their houses and their cars and he would show them how they're living. This, that and the other. God has nothing to do with that. Serving God is not a guarantee that you are going to become wealthy and you are going to become rich. No, serving God is a guarantee that my life is in line with his will. Serving God means that at the end of the day, if I take my last breath because he promised that I will go to heaven if I live right, then I'm going to believe and trust in God that that is what I need to do. So in essence, I'm letting God be God. He that comes to him must believe that he is. It requires me to believe that there is something greater than myself. When I go out and I see the sky like this, I see and I know that there is something greater than myself. I know that, that the thing that I'm going through now, the hell and the high water, the stress, the hurt, the pain, everything that I'm going through now, that there's something greater in that. And if I focus my heart and my trust on that thing that is greater, it may not take the situation, it may not take me out of the hell that I'm going through, it may not take me out of the hurt that I'm going through, it may not take me out of the pain, but I know in the end of the day, he has me. If I just let him be God. Exodus 3 and 13. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? This is the situation where God, Moses sees the burning bush and he was so fascinated by this fire that was consuming the bush and the bush was not consumed by the fire that he had to go and see it. And the bush, out of the bush, burning bush, there spoke a voice. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus so you should say to the Israelites, I am has sent you. Somebody get me a napkin, paper towel. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. In essence, God is metamorphic, and whatever you need me to be in that moment, I am that. Whatever is required, whatever is needed, I will be that if you are sick and you are in need of a healer i will be the healer if you are in need of a savior i will be that if you are in need of some of showing me of my mighty hand i will be that i will be what you need me to be when you need me to be it therefore i can't define 
myself as just one thing. I must define myself when the moment calls for me to be it. Letting God be God. Jesus had a question. The disciple said to Jesus, show us the Father. Show us God. Jesus. And here's the thing. Sorry about that. He said, show us the Father. Jesus said, you're looking at him. John 14 and 6, Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know the Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. When you see me, Jesus is saying, you've seen the Father. So if anyone wants to get in touch with God, anyone who want to know what God is like, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the Gospels of Jesus Christ. These are the life and the stories, the birth the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to know what God is like, read the Gospels. They give you an example. Jesus Christ is God in flesh and gives you an example of who God is. That if you just allow God to be God. If you just allow him to take the reins. And the problem is, is that we feel like life that God is asking for us to go like this. And to fall back into his arms. And in essence, he's saying he wants you to trust him to be God. So when you see and you read about Jesus Christ, I don't really know anything about God. Read about Jesus Christ. You've seen him. Letting God be God means letting go and trusting in the very definition of who God is. So that's where the struggle comes up, comes with us. Is that we find it difficult to let go and literally to let God be God. So the question is, we say, I say, you as believers, you say that God is good. He is. You say God is great. He is. You say God is everlasting. He is. God says, I am he who was and is and is to come. He is all of those things. You say that he is great. He's powerful. He's all knowing. He is. So then why do we have a problem letting him be those very things? Who is God? Genesis 1 describes God as the creator of all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void was across the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And out of darkness came light. And God began to do his masterful design. He began to paint the universe. He began to put the star here. He put the moon there. He put the sun there and all oh, making these dots. And while he was there, he began to create the earth and he begins to mold the earth. Ooh, man. Ooh, I like that right there. Ooh, that's hot. He's probably saying, cause that's what I would say. Oh man, I'm gonna put the Grand Canyon right there. If you have never seen the Grand Canyon, you gotta go see the Grand Canyon. It is amazing because when you see the different layers and layers and man, God created this. I know they say the Colorado River created this. Well, how come it ain't still creating it today? I mean, that's neither here nor there, but think about it. But the Grand Canyon, he created the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. He created all these things and he began to form and he said, let there be. And after everything that God said that he created, he says, this is good. But he thought, man, there's something missing. There's something missing. There's something missing. <gasps> Let us create man in our image after our likeness. In essence, we are what we are where we are now, heaven. But he will be like we are on earth. So how we are in heaven, he will be like he he will be like us but only on earth. So God created man in his image after his likeness, he breathed the breath of life and man became a living soul. God loved us so much that when he created us, he gave us free will. And here's the free will. He gave us the free will to say, man, I don't believe you. He gave us the free will to say, I don't trust you. 
He gave us the free will to reject him. He gave us the free will. It's like, man, I, I don't love you. I, I, I blaspheme your name. I do all these things. I reject what you're about. He gave us the free will. And see, here's the thing. A lot of people say, how come with God is all great? Why don't he do these things? Because he loves us. Now, when God created man, he could have he cr could have created us as automatons where he just literally programs us in. Now, I can change the voice of my phone to sound like a British woman. I can uh, change the phone, my phone to sound like a country woman. I can change the sound of my phone to make it sound like Soundwave from Transformers. I can make it sound like Optimus Prime. I can make it sound like Goku. I can make my phone sound like everything, but I'm in control. My phone's not doing it. I'm doing it. I'm programming, but God made us to have a free will. And here's the interesting thing about us. Even when we reject him, his love for us has not changed. Letting God be God. I made you to have a free will. Well, God, I love you. That's great. God, I reject you. Okay, but I still love you. Just want to let you know that. That is who God is. But here's Romans 58. 5 and 8 says this, but God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, letting God be God, the creator of all things. Matter of fact, after he created man, he didn't just say it was good. He said it was very good. And I think about the, crea the creation and God began to instruct Adam. He began to teach Adam. He was the mentor. Adam was the mentee. And he began to show Adam, Adam, and Adam, I want to show you what authority and power that you have. I'm going to bring you this animal. Whatever you call it, Adam, this is what it's going to be. Adam, mm, that's a lion. That's a tiger. That's a bear. That's a rhino. That's a giraffe. That's an elephant. That's a hippo. That's a cheetah, that's a dog, that's a cat, that's a whale. All right, Adam, whatever you call it, that is what it's going to be. God was teaching. But here's the love of God right here, letting God be God. There's something still missing. Ah, I know what's missing. I'm going to give him a helpmate. And he made Adam to go to sleep, and then when Adam wake up, he sees Eve and he sees bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And therefore, she shall be called woman because she came out of the womb of man. God created woman out of Adam. And the Bible says, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. But then one particular day. Adam allowed his wife to have a conversation with the serpent. And from this conversation, the bait and swip, switch, Eve ate of the fruit. And she bit of the fruit and gave the fruit to Adam to eat of. And when they ate of the fruit, their eyes were both open and they knew that they were naked. And because they knew that they were naked, they sowed leaves to cover themselves. And then the Bible says that in the evening, in the cool of the day, the spirit of the Lord came walking through the garden. And he could not find Adam because the identifying factor was that he created Adam in his image. So the illumination that was coming from Adam, being as though that he was made in an image of God, but on earth had been going out. So therefore, God said, Adam, where are you? Because the light that used to illuminate from you, I no longer see that light. Adam said, um, I hid because I was naked. And God was like, oh, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of that fruit that I told you not to eat of? Yeah, but that woman you gave me, uh, she gave it to me. And so on. And here's the love of God because God chastised Adam. God ch chastised Eve. God chastised the serpent. And because he loved us so much. God killed an animal and he clothed Adam and Eve with the skin of the animal. God loved us so much that we disobeyed him. But in his love, I got to clothe you 
to cover your shame, to cover your nakedness, letting God be God. That is the love of God. But God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 and 8. In essence, what Jesus did was saying, my actions are going to speak louder than words. So while we were in sin, yet sin eating, doing sin and thinking about sin tomorrow, Jesus Christ still died because of my inability and to my wishy-washy ways. I, he, he died for my sins. And letting God be God because Moses couldn't do what Jesus did. He got frustrated and hit the rock. David couldn't do what Jesus did because David got prideful and wanted to show how strong he was. Jonah couldn't do what Jesus did because Jonah was racist and felt like no one deserved to hear the gospel or to hear the good news or to hear the warning. But letting God be God, look past all my faults, my rejection, and he saw my knees and said, I will go and die for Stephen. Letting God be God. Why am I saying this? Because you should not look at me as an example to be a good Christian. You should not look at me at all. This is why Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm not following Christ, if my lifestyle does not line up with the Bible, that should not take you away from God. Because if you, Bishop Price always told us to study the scripture for yourself. Read it for yourself. And if you read it for yourself, then you will get an understanding. And I tell you, I started to read it for myself. And man, the things that I was taught growing up, I began to question everything. Because I'm seeing God be God. And it wasn't a traditional thing that man had implemented. He demonstrated his love by dying for us, Romans 5 and 8. Matter of fact, what is the last thing Jesus said to his disciples? He says, man, love one another as I have loved you. Emulate me. And by this, people are going to identify you with me when you do what I did. Letting God be God. How is that? Because God is infinite, which means he's self-existent without origin. God is immutable, means he never changes. God is self-sufficient. He has no needs. He has a desire, though. He has a desire. Get me 2 Peter 3 and 9. 2 Peter 3 and 9. Let's see if anybody's quick. 2 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but to everyone to come to repentance. God is not slow, but he's patient. That is his desire that we should all come to repentance. God is omnipotent. That means he's all powerful. God is omniscient. That means he is all knowing. God is omnipresent. That means he is everywhere. God is wise. He's full of perfect, unchanging wisdom. God is faithful. He is infinite, unchanging, and true. God is good. He is infinite, unchanging, kind, and full of good will. God is just. He is infinite, unchanging, right, and perfect in all he does. God is merciful. He is infinite, unchanging, compassionate, and kind. There were times that, man, maybe I should have. Maybe what I did, maybe what I said, but God, his mercy endured forever. God is gracious. God is infinite, inclined to spare the guilty. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Psalms 103 says, my sin required me to die. But Jesus Christ got in front of death and said, I'll take the brunt that was meant for Stephen. And I will die in his place, letting God be God. God is loving. 
His love is infinite and he's unchanging. Psalms John 3, 16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God is holy. He's unchanging and perfect. God is glorious. He is infinite, beautiful, and great. Hebrews again says, we ought to believe. What is the definition of the belief? To accept something as true, genuine, real, or ideas. Hebrews says that when we come to him, that we must believe that he is. That no matter where I find myself, the situation that I find myself in, I must believe that he is. Thank you, God. The Hebrew boys had a position to take. King Nebuchadnezzar said, man, when you hear the sound of the music, you're to drop what you're doing and worship the idol that I created. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, nah, we're not going to worship that. And a beautiful thing about that is they not only said it to the face of the servants, the people, I ain't worship, please, I ain't bowing down to no idol. That's against what we're supposed to do. And they brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before the king. They brought him before authority. And the king was upset. He was like, tell me, it's not true that you're not going to worship the idol that I built. And they said, O king, we be not careful to answer you in this manner. For the God we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. Letting God be God. In that situation, I probably would have been like, okay, I'm bow down, Lord forgive me. Because I was afraid. I am human. But letting God be God, the Hebrew boy said, we're, we're not going to bow down. And the king was so upset with that, that he ordered that the fiery furnace be hot, heated five times hotter. And he got a strongest guard to bind them up and to take them up and drop them into the fire of furnace. And while they were on their way up to be dropped into the fire of furnace, the fire was so out of control that it killed the guards. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell into the fiery furnace. But when they got into the furnace, there was no heat. Do you see the correlation, the burning bush, the bush that was on fire, but it wasn't consumed? Shadrach and Meshach fell into a furnace where the fire did not consume them because they allowed God to be God. They were of the mindset that God, even if you don't save us, we know that you're capable of doing it. But even if you do not save us, we're not going to do it. Believing that he is. I believe Romans. Paul said Romans 8 and 38 says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things presence, nor things come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says, I'm persuaded. I'm brainwashed in this thing that no matter what you say. You can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. You can't make me change my mind because I believe. And the definition of believe is to accept something that's true, genuine, and real. Paul says, I believe it too much. Letting God be God. Here's the glove of God. The thief on the cross was dying. He was dying because he, was, he did something wrong. He was either a murderer or whatever. And one thief says, Jesus, if, if, if you're the son of God, get yourself down off the cross and get me down too. The second thief says, man, don't you fear God? We're up here because we deserve to be up here. But this man ain't do nothing. And he simply said, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Jesus says to the thief on the cross, 
this day you shall be with me in paradise. I love that for the simple fact that Jesus' lungs was filling up with blood. He'd already got beat with a cat of nine tails, which is broken rock and glass. The Bible says that he was barely recognizable. Not only was that he was pierced in his side, not only that he was nailed in his foot, not only that he was nailed in his hand, not only that he was had to carry his own cross, not only that he was nailed to said cross, not only that his mother is below in agony looking at her son who she barely recognized. But Jesus Christ, while he is on the cross, letting God be God, he says to the thief. This day you're going to be with me in paradise. He offers salvation, man. What if Jesus would have been like Peter and cut off? What if he would have came off the cross because Peter wanted to show how strong Jesus was and he picked up the sword and cut off that man's ear? Jesus could have very well have come off the cross. Jesus very well could have called a legion of angels to his side. And if he had did that, the angels would have had to obey. But while he was in his agony, he offered salvation. And you may say, well, man, I, and I thought like this, that man, when I'm about to die, I'm just going to repent and say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me. That's what I'm going to do. That's why I used to thought, think. That man, when I die, I'm just going to ask God to forgive me. And according to the Bible, he's going to forgive me. And then I'm going to die and I'm going to go to heaven. So I can live the way I want to live. I can live the way I want to live. Do whatever I want to do. And just at that last moment, man. (laughs) I can do that and just be like the thief and say, forgive me. But what if that moment doesn't come for you what if you're in a car accident and you're killed instantly what if you're somewhere and there's a shooting and a bullet has no name they say and you're struck and you die instantly what if are you willing to take that chance are you willing to take that chance to say that you're going to be like the carters Jimmy Carter and his wife and just be at a very old age where you're still at your wits end and you can still talk or be like uh, uh, Henry Kissinger who was 100 years old, wrote a book last year and had an interview a couple weeks ago, still talking and was making plans, whatever, to go someplace. Nah, maybe it ain't going to be like that. You never know where death is around the corner. Never know. But God loved us so much that he shed an animal's blood to cover our shame with Adam. And he loved us so much that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die in place of our sins. Psalms 103. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. I deserve to go to hell. I deserve. But God demonstrated his love for me. That while we were yet sinner in sin and sinning and keep on sinning, he died for us. Even when we rejected him, even when we came back and rejected him again, even when we came back and walked away again, even when we came back and walked again, and even when we came back and even when we said we won't do it no more and we still did it again. And even when we said we're going to do it again and we still did it again. We said, okay, this is the last time and we still did it again. He still died. God's names are his attributes and his characteristics. Exodus 16, 3, God told Moses, by my name, I appeared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and to Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. God is saying, they only knew a part of me. They knew me as God Almighty, all sufficient and strong and powerful. But I'm going to introduce you to another name that I go by, and that is by Jehovah or Yahweh or Yahweh. The things that you're going through, I heard you. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to keep my word. So call me Jehovah Sabaoth because I'm going to keep my words. In essence, my word cannot return unto me unfulfilled. 
Whatever I speak out of my mouth, it has to find a place, grow, take plant, root, and grow. It has to come to pass because I said it. Not only is it going to grow, but it's going to prosper in that very thing. Letting God be God. The intro, this is who God is. As Al Shaddai, God had revealed himself as almighty God who could do anything he promised to do. But as Yahweh, God was revealing himself as the covenant keeper. God was vowing to be God almighty on behalf of the people of Israel. Whatever you need me to be, I am that. Jesus had a conversation with a man, Luke 9 and 6. And he says, yet another says, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at home. Jesus said unto him, no one who puts his hand toward the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The young man just was saying to Jesus, let me go home and say goodbye to my family. That seems pretty reasonable. And Jesus was like, no man who put his hand to the plow. If you ever seen a farmer with a plow with a horse or an ox pulling it, Man, I can't look back to say anything to talk or have a conversation because if I look back, what I'm trying to steer ahead of me, I may go off course. Jesus letting us know that even sometime that's a huge blessing in our lives can become a distraction if it becomes more important than pursuing Jesus and his purpose. When something becomes so more than you pursuing Jesus Christ, it becomes a distraction. And then we start making excuses. Man, I, I, I remember when I was Monday through Friday and I was working for Benef was I working for Beneficial? I was working for some bank. And I was like Sunday through Thursday. And I remember them was like, hey, Steve, we got a Monday through Friday. You want to go Monday through Friday? They're like, yeah, that's great. And I just remember like, man, I'm just going to go. Uh, I made up my mind. I'm going to go to church. Go back to church. And then Sunday came and I, I woke up and I was like, yeah, I'll go next week. Next Sunday, Saturday, I was like, oh man, I'm going to church tomorrow. I woke up Sunday, eh, I'll go next week. Again, woke up again, eh, I'll go next week. See, and it never happened. When it becomes more important than pursuing Jesus and his purpose, it becomes a distraction. As we continue to seek Jesus, we must constantly be aware of the potential distractions in our view, rear view mirror of life. There can often be a tendency to look back and remember the good instead of the great that is front of you. It's good if I go back and say goodbye, but man, if it's great that I, I'm following Jesus. Because I got to believe that he is and that the potential of me saying goodbye is going to present itself. Proverbs 3 and 5 says this, that trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understandings. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. There's some verses that say he will make his path straight. I don't believe that. Because straight sets up an unexpected expectation of how life is and life isn't like straight. So I have to trust and believe God and allow God to be God that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear because thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff that they comfort me. Thou prepare for the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days. I got to trust and believe that God he is so that when I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, that when I'm walking through the turns of life, that when I get to one turn, he's there. When I get to the next turn, he's there, but he's leading me. And I may not understand it, or comprehend it. But if I just trust him and allow him to be God. That I say he is. All of those attributes of what God is. If I just trust and believe that it is, The outcome is going to work in my favor. That scripture. Hebrews 11 and 6 is what we started off with. Without faith. It is impossible to believe it. Please God. Because anyone who approaches him. Must believe. 
that he is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How do I seek him? Romans 10, 9 says it best, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confessed and are saved. You can't just think it. it has to come from your mouth. I have to believe what I'm saying. As I ask every week, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? If the answer is no, if it's I'm 99% sure, man, that's a no. If I'm 99.9% .9 sure, that's a no. I repent every day because I'm not perfect. I repent every day. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Why? For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that confession is made unto salvation. I got to believe and allow God to be God. God, I'm not looking for a million dollars. I'm just looking for salvation. God, I'm not looking for a mansion. But God, if you can bring me the peace that I seek. God, if you can bring me hope, if you can bring me joy, if I can just trust you and believe that you're going to make everything all right. But even if everything doesn't come all right, I'm in a better place than I am now than I was. And that is why I put my trust in you. Think about this. This is why I say, read the Gospels of Jesus Christ to follow him. If the disciples were some nutcases who didn't believe anything, I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't dying for something I don't believe in. I'm not dying for a man that Peter was crucified upside down. Some of the disciples were cut in half. Some of them were boiled. But yet they all went to their graves with the same notion that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he's coming back. And I'm dying believing that. Letting God be God. If he's going to save me, he saves me. If he doesn't, he's still God. I know I keep talking, but if you want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is the introduction. Letting God be God. There's going to be a part two. Letting God be God. The intro is getting to know who Jesus Christ is, that he is the son and he loves you. He loves you. He died for you and he's waiting for you. That moment where you're thinking in that quiet time, I need to get my life right. That thing that you're looking for, that there's got to be something better. I'm not looking for riches and fame, but I'm just looking for something. I'm just looking for a peace that surpasses all understanding, something that gives me hope, something that gives me joy because I can't find it in the pill. I can't find it in the bottle. I can't find it in TV. I can't find it in this person and that person, but there's got to be something greater. There's got to be something greater. And I'm telling you that greater is God. Through Jesus Christ. And if that, if you believe that today, you have an opportunity right now at 11, 10 a.m. to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. How do I do that? Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, first you got to believe it. I got to believe it. That, man, I got to believe. I, it, and, and here's the thing. It's childlike faith. I just remember you what you wanted for on your birthday and you were just like hoping, it. oh, man, I, I, I got to believe. I got to believe. I got to believe. I got to believe. Lord Jesus, forgive me. No matter what it is, I, I, I don't know. It's something to stop me because somebody said, somebody just said, he can't forgive me for something that I've done. Yes, he can. And he did already. If Hitler would have asked for forgiveness, he would have been forgiven. Oh, but Bin Laden would have asked for uh, uh, forgiveness. He would have been forgiven. But it's coming from the heart. And I believe that God can change. Paul, 
persecuted the church. Thought he was doing the right thing, thought he was doing God's will. But eventually, he, his eyes were open unto the truth. And the Bible says that the scales fell from his eyes. If that's you, believe. I don't know who just said that, but God already forgave you. You just have to believe it and accept it. So here we go again. Jump on board. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe that you die for me. I believe that you rose from me. I believe that you're coming back again. Come into my heart and save me and I shall be saved. Forgive me of all of my sins. I acknowledge you as my Lord and Savior. If you said that prayer with me, high five, high five, welcome to the kingdom of God. I encourage you again to read the gospels to get an understanding of who Jesus Christ is. That's the purpose of this message of letting God be God because he's bigger than my situation and I just got to trust that he's able to bring me through it and bring me out of it or give me clarity for it. Beloved, this is Pastor Stephen J. of Faith Works Church. If you would like to be a financial blessing, look us up on the Givelify app and see Faith Works Church. You'll see this mug. Know that's me. Give whatever your heart's desire. Or if you want to cash at me, dollar sign Faith Works 1109, dollar sign Faith Works 1109. I just thought about something funny because <laughs> First Lady Price has said something to me a while ago and she was like, I want to be a blessing. I want to be a blessing. I was like, you can dollar sign me, cash app, Faith Works 1109. I don't know how to do no cash app. <laughs> And I think she sent me in and she just sent the money in the mail. So it just popped into my head. But if you want to be a blessing, be a blessing. Faith Works 11, dollar sign Faith Works 1109. Put a comment on the video, comment on YouTube, comment on Facebook. You want to send me an email, faithworks1109 at yahoo.com. This is Pastor Stephen J. God bless. Let's continue to pray for the people in Ukraine. Let's continue to pay for the people in Israel and Palestine. Let's continue to pray for our world leaders. Let's continue to pray for each other. And remember, letting God be God requires us to let go and let him be God. God bless, and I'll see you next week.